Works of the law and works of love or Christ. One of Satan's biggest lies exposed. There are no shortage of verses that say that salvation or the justification of righteousness unto eternal life is by grace or by faith and not works. So one of our most highly quoted and loved examples is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Another great example, Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans 3.28 is another clear example, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law and deeds being synonymous with works. And there are many other examples we could use that don't use this exact language but still support the same idea, like Romans 10 verses 4 and 5, Hebrews 6 verse 1, Galatians 3 verses 21 to 26. There are many other passages we could turn to, of course. Notwithstanding the logical inference that Jesus and the apostles told many people to believe for eternal life without telling them to do works for that life. And when they did preach repentance, they were talking about Jesus, not about your works. This is a major discrepancy and a huge inconvenience for many Christians who have a works-based salvation, whether that's front-loaded or back-loaded, especially for the ones where James 2 is their favourite part of the whole Bible. So even with the multitude of verses from Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, John, Philippians that show that salvation or justification unto righteousness is without works, they use this one chapter in James 2 to completely reinterpret, reject and overturn those multitudes of other verses instead of reinterpreting interpreting what they believe about James 2 in light of the multitude, and they're wrong about what James 2 means by the way. A detailed breakdown of James 2 is outside of the subject of this video, but even James himself said in that same chapter that makes legalists drool with excitement, for whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Even their work salvation porn passage verifies what Paul says, that justification cannot be attained by the law if you mess it up even once, and everybody has. So given that so many Christians are just so desperate to merit their salvation and boast in their works, they have this little disclaimer, or clause if you will, that enables them to preach works salvation in some fashion, while still claiming to be consistent with these multitudes of scriptures that say it's by grace or faith without works. So how they do this, typically what I've seen them do, is they'll say something along the lines of, when Paul says we are saved or justified without works, this is just referring to works of the old covenant law, the rituals, the cleansings, the sacrifices, and circumcision particularly. But in order to be saved or justified, we must have works referring to the law of Christ, they sometimes call it, or the law of love, or the works of a saving faith, which they would argue is just another way of saying doing his will to enter the kingdom as per Matthew 7, or keeping his commandments as per John 14 15, or doing works by faith as per Hebrews 11. So, for example, I'll show you how they substantiate this. They might use Galatians 5, 6, where it says that circumcision does not avail anything. So this is Paul's faith without works for justification. It's it's the Mosaic law that doesn't avail. But then describes faith as working by love. And they'll say that this is James's faith with works, if you like. And they sometimes call this something like Christ's new law of love or words to that effect. And so likewise, we go to James 2 and they'll say that verse 10 is the Mosaic law. Yes, we can't keep the whole of that law but we do have to do works of love or the works of Christ as per later in the chapter. And to give you another example of how they argue this, so if we take a verse like Romans 3.8, it specifically calls these works of the law. But then when we read Ephesians 2.10, it says we are created unto good works and it doesn't mention the law. So that's not about the Mosaic law, it's the new law of love as it were. I've handpicked two very specific individuals. I want to show you video clips of them saying this because it will lead us into something important later. Um, there's places all over the Bible says we're saved by faith apart from works, and it's always works of the law. The old covenant of the Jews, their rituals, their cleansings, and all those Old Testament works, yeah, we're not saved by those. But Christ commands us, he ordained us to do good works, I mean, meaning we have to do good works. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. He's talking about, he specifies what type of works. 
That's right. He's not talking about the, the works of obedience like James 2 is talking about. He says exactly what works he's talking about. He, he makes this very, very plain. He, he right. says a, man, uh, a person is not justified by works of the law. Now, Keith. So to the unlearned Christian who doesn't know the Bible very well, this seems like they've got their doctrine locked. They've, they've solved it, right? Well, yes, we're not saved by works of the law, but faith does have to produce works of love according to this new law of Christ. But when you study the implications of this, you realise that this teaching has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. And I'll barely scratch the surface in this video of what they all are, but let's, let's start with the inconsistency. So I showed you two clips. One person is a Roman Catholic, the other is a sinless perfectionist. So we've got works tards from completely different denominations who are copying and pasting this same boring argument. So the first hole in the Swiss cheese, if you like, is that everybody who proclaims salvation by works in some form or another has their own often borderline unique list of pet works that they think you should be doing. So for example, Greg at Bible Flockbox is a Seventh-day Adventist. He believes that Sabbath keeping on Saturday is an essential component of salvation. Now I understand there is some irony in making rest day work for your salvation, but there you go. When it comes to your lifestyle, he is looking for a vaguely defined, observable change in your behaviour. Mike Krakowski believes that we need to learn to test the spirits and overcome our sicknesses and sins until we learn to become sanctified in truth disciples of Christ. Yet he says that Sabbath keeping does not apply in the New Testament. Now interestingly, you don't have to do any actual work in his framework like preaching the gospel to every creature. You should only preach the gospel if you're a sanctified in truth disciple of Christ, like Mike Rakowski. Although apparently he is the only one who has reached this status on the whole planet of 8 billion people. But God hasn't commanded him to preach the gospel yet, so we're all off the hook for that particular commandment. Mike Schmitz at Ascension Presents is Roman Catholic, so he reckons we should be doing the Catholic sacraments like confessing sins in his confessional booth. But you don't need to obey the commandment to preach the gospel to every creature or call no man upon earth father. Catholics don't obey these anyway, so you're off the hook for these. Michaela Cooper tells you that the key to life is a surrender. This means getting on your knees and seeking the Lord every single day in prayer until you've reached full surrender. I can only assume this is a trauma-induced gospel revelation she received while being held hostage at gunpoint. Mormons ironically do try to fulfil the Great Commission, being made to go door to door to evangelise their religion. This is a work you have to do for salvation, under their model, to fulfil the commandment to preach the gospel to every creature. You don't have to obey the commandment not to lie, though apparently in white man's Islam you can lie if it helps promote the religion, apparently. Of course, JWs and Mormons are not the only Christians who say that a saving faith must be preaching the gospel, but for other Christians, the correct method apparently is screaming at people in the streets and provoking them to anger. Not going door to door and having a sensible one-to-one -one conversation, that wouldn't incite the minimum level of persecution needed to achieve or maintain salvation. Look, there's far more examples I could give, but I'm sure you get the point. Different individuals or groups of Christians will have different lists of their pet works and pet commandments that they like to obsess about, right? This is because if you try throughout the Bible to read works into salvation passages or you try to read salvation into works passages, well, then you're not going to get consistent instructions because basically Jesus just told this random group of Jews in John chapter 6 for some bizarre reason to do communion for everlasting life, which doesn't even exist as an ordinance yet. The disciples don't even know what this is but nobody else apparently and then in john chapter 3 he told one random individual in very poetic indirect language apparently to be baptized for everlasting life but he didn't tell anybody else in john's gospel for some weird reason when jesus spoke specifically to peter it was deny self take up the cross and follow me apparently but you know what, false prophets are always wrong about what that means, of course, as I've demonstrated in other videos. Herein lies the problem. There is no unanimous agreement or biblical definition of what the appropriate saving works of love or Christ produced by a saving faith are. The Jews had the same problem in Jesus' time. In Mark 7, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for enforcing commandments that weren't even in the Bible, yet not following commandments that were in the Bible. They often explained away commandments like the law's requirements about divorce, for instance. And so this leads me on to the second hole in the Swiss cheese. And you may have actually already noticed this in the slides, but what they do is they arbitrarily change the definition of works either within the same verse or passage so they pick and choose when they decide that works are of the mosaic law and when they decide that works are of a saving faith as it suits them to do so or as an extension of this what they might do is cherry pick specific verses where works are described as being of the law and ignore the verses where it doesn't specifically say of the law 
So let's tackle the cherry picking. Well, actually, not too long ago, um, Honorato Diamante released a video very similar to the subject I'm covering in this video, actually. So I would encourage you to go on his channel and check it out. I'll put a link in the description. And in his video, he shows a Catholic channel, and it's called How to Be a Christian. And he uses several verses to justify this argument that it's only works of the law that we're not justified by. because, But because of James 2, we are still justified by works, just not of the law. And the summary of his argument was that all the works of the law are works, but not all works are works of the law, if that makes sense. But what he did was he specifically cherry-picked the verses that do say of the law. He declined to include verses that say works not being justified or saved without directly mentioning the law, like our classic favourite Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There is no mention of the law in this passage, it just says works. Paul even takes it a step further and says, not of yourselves. If we were saved by any kind of works, this statement would not be true. In fact, the word law is only ever mentioned once in the entire book of Ephesians, just a few verses later actually, and it's in reference to Christ, not your works, and that's in verse 15. There is no indication that Ephesians 2, 8 or 9 refers to of the law works only. So then when using this same passage that he conveniently left out, Watch uh, the other Roman Catholic who I showed you earlier. Watch him change the definition of what works are in this passage. But Christ commands us in Ephesians 2.10, he ordained us to do good works. I mean, meaning we have to do good works. Now, false prophets rely on your stupidity. They think you're stupid. They think you're intellectually retarded. So they're counting on you not knowing what they're doing here. If Ephesians 2 is saying in verses 8 to 9 that we are not saved by works of the Mosaic Old Covenant law, but we must do works of the New Covenant for salvation in verse 10, then the definition of works has suddenly changed. Brian Mercier has changed the definition of works between verses 9 and 10 in the hope that you won't catch him out for doing this. So let's look at verses 8 to 10 on the screen here. Okay, so we're not saved by works, but we are created on two good works. Has Paul inserted a clause between verses 9 and 10 to say that the definition of works has suddenly changed from one sentence to the next? Has Paul added any categories after the word works in either verse, as in works of the law or works of love? Now, Brian Mercier knows that most Catholics are intellectually and spiritually challenged. So he knows that they're just going to clap and say, wow, brother, you explain things so great. You know, how can anybody stand against the Roman Catholic Church? Of course, the only Catholics who actually bother to study the Bible and stay Catholic are the ones who complete a doctorate in how to parrot Catholic talking points and quote early church fathers ad nauseum. Now, again, people try these little tricks and say, well, it says good works, so we're not saved by works, but we are saved by doing good works. Well, the thing is, Jesus said there's none good but God, okay? Paul said there's none that does good, okay? So good works or works, it's still the same category. Either we're saved by works or we're not. So what are these New Testament works of love, as it were, that Ephesians 2.10 is telling us that we should walk in? Well, it doesn't strictly say in chapter 2 itself, so let's just fast forward to later in the book of Ephesians. So it says in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, Be you therefore followers of Christ, as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ has also loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling saviour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becomes saints. Now then, is abstaining from fornication a radical New Testament concept according to the law of love? It is based on Old Testament commandments. Is abstaining from covetousness a radical New Testament concept according to the law of love? It is also from the Old Testament, even the Ten Commandments, it comes from the Mosaic Law. Ephesians is not the only example of the New Testament commanding free in Christ believers to observe commandments from the Old Testament Mosaic Law, even while saying we cannot be justified unto righteousness by said law. Paul repeatedly told us to observe commandments from the Mosaic Law in the same books where he also said there is no justification by works. James said, if you fulfill the royal law, and he's citing an Old Testament law when he says this, you do well, in the same chapter as where he said that by offending one law, you do so to the whole law. And all of this leads us to the next big hole in this nonsense. Jesus himself preached the law. So if we have to observe 
all of Christ's commandments and moral instructions under this New Testament law of love, then by definition we have to obey at least some of the Old Testament Mosaic law. So I showed you a clip from Adam from Abide in the Word saying that we're not saved by the Old Testament law. Now let's look at this double talking hypocritical politician say that we do have to keep the law because he uses Jesus' dialogue with the lawyer tempting him as an argument for the things that we have to do for eternal life when Jesus is quoting the Old Testament law. There was a lawyer that came up to Jesus and he asked him, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And this is a great question. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, this is absolutely insulting. You cannot earn your salvation. Who do you think you are? No, he actually said, you have answered correctly. This is the right answer. So you see how the people that preach this, they just make up their own rules, change them when it suits them. They tell you to turn from your sins to be saved when they're a bunch of scripture-twisting, sinful, wicked reprobates. An honest assessment of biblical language leads you to believe that works and law pretty much amount to the same thing. If salvation requires works of any kind, then inevitably it requires keeping of the law. When Jesus told his disciples to love one another, this is not some crazy New Testament concept that didn't exist before. The Old Testament commanded believers to love your neighbour as yourself, and there were various laws that the Israelites actually had to do acts of loving towards each other in action. It wasn't just passively or in thought. They had to do something. Like, for example, being witnesses to crimes. Don't turn a blind eye to justice, okay? Helping the poor. And when your brother is in need and so on and so on. These are not crazy New Testament ideas. They were always there from the Mosaic law in the first place. In fact, with maybe one or two exceptions, or a handful at most, almost all commandments in the New Testament, specifically on moral issues at least, come from the Old Testament Mosaic law, either directly or building on the same ideas. Not only did Jesus himself preach the law, he made the law even more difficult to follow than it was already perceived to be before. The Sermon on the Mount epitomises this. In Matthew 5, Jesus said that you have heard that it was said of them of old time, you shall not kill, but whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raker shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And just a few verses later, he goes on to say, You have heard it said of them of all time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. To follow Jesus' New Testament commandments, you inevitably must follow Old Testament Mosaic law, for which the Sermon on the Mount holds you to a higher standard than Old Testament saints. Furthermore, this same chapter tells you to be perfect. So if you're going to follow his commandments according to this structure, you must do so perfectly. As we already saw from every false prophet's favourite chapter in the Bible, James said, if you offend the law at one point, you are guilty of all. So why should that be any different for this so-called new law of love when Christ is telling you to be perfect? Now at this point, this is where the servants of Satan start to get desperate and they say things like, Actually, the works of the law that we don't follow are just ceremonial things like ordinances, like circumcision and washings. We still have to follow all the moral laws. Well, this just exposes another hole in their Swiss cheese. So this hole is basically the false separation between moral laws and commandments and non-moral laws and commandments, arguing that we are still obliged to do works of the former, just not the latter. Now, the book of Hebrews does explain that certain things are done away with, okay, because some things were a sign of the testament or the covenant. Furthermore, Christians are commanded to do certain works that do set us apart from the unbelieving world. And that's a whole video in itself. We don't have time to go into it now. If anybody ever tries to use this argument, ask them to confirm whether or not they believe that baptism and the Lord's Supper and the preaching of the gospel are required works for salvation. Because once again, these false prophets talk out of both sides of the mouth, and I've heard them do this. They say that we still have to follow these moral laws, but then they impose non-moral issues as salvific requirements, just saying that the Old Testament ones are done away with, but the New Testament ones still apply. Well, what has baptism got to do with fleshly sins? Does being baptised prove that anybody lives their life any differently? Likewise, what has taking the Lord's Supper got to do with fleshly sins? Nothing. 
preaching the gospel is a bit unique here in that it's a somewhat unique commandment to the New Testament. But preaching the gospel is not in of itself proof that you live your life any differently. And these street screaming bozos that scream repent of your sins, they're filthy wicked sinners themselves. But again, another video for another day. But my point is that it's not just moral works and turning from fleshly sins, is it? It obviously needs closer inspection than that when you start investigating everything that we have to do according to these people. One of the tricks that they will employ here is to point out that when Paul talked about not being justified by the law, he was pointing to the circumcision issue particularly. Therefore, they will say he was getting at not being circumcised for salvation and justification, not other works which we still have to do for our salvation, including those pertaining to moral issues and sins of the flesh and so on. Well, in the book of Galatians, you could sort of make this case insofar as Paul was tackling some of the Galatian members that were trying to bring circumcision into the churches. And so, yes, it, in Galatians, it was in response to that issue. In Ephesians, very much like of the law, it only mentions circumcision once, but Paul doesn't apply it to the definition of works. He's just saying that the Gentiles were of the uncircumcision, but now have the promises and hope. I think Romans is the best book to completely dispel this fraudulent argument. So Romans 2.25 is the first mention of circumcision in the book of Romans. It starts with the word for, which means it is a continuation to support an argument he was making prior to this. So let's rewind. So he opens the chapter saying that you judge but are inexcusable because you do the same things. And this is a continuation of Romans 1 where he just finished talking about the reprobate mind and the evil things that reprobates do. And he was pointing to moral fleshly sin issues. As a side note, the same false prophets that use this circumcision trick use Romans 2, 6 to 8 to argue that we still have to do works to be saved. So remember, they themselves are using this passage to argue for work salvation. Carry on reading and Paul says that we who have sinned in the law will be judged by it because to be justified by the law you must do it, obviously all of it. He then goes on to target the Jew specifically who rests in the law. A few verses later Paul challenges the hypothetical Jewish reader for judging and teaching others asking hypothetically if they do these things. These are moral issues. And then after establishing these points, he uses his comment on circumcision to justify what he just said regarding the moral law. After chapter 2, Paul will go on to explain in chapter 3 that everybody is guilty according to the law. All have sinned according to the law. If he was only talking about circumcision specifically, chapter 3 would be utterly ridiculous because almost every Jewish male in existence, at least at Paul's time, was by definition not sinning against this law and has not fallen short of the glory of God. Paul could have described the reprobate mind in chapter 1, or the judgmental Jews in chapter 2, or the sinful men in chapter 3, as those who fail to meet the sacrificial requirements and fail to do the other cardinal ordinances, like the washings, etc. But Paul dealt specifically with moral laws, sins of the flesh, adultery, stealing, wickedness, etc. Romans 1 explained that it is these things that bring about the wrath of God. Therefore, it is because of these wicked works that we cannot be justified by the law, not because of the circumcision issue. Paul did not use circumcision here to make a distinction between justifying works and non-justifying works. Instead, he used circumcision to illustrate the futility of works justification for righteousness, specifically because we failed the moral aspects of the law, not the covenantal aspects. So when Paul says we're not justified by works of the law, he's not stating that the reason we're not justified is because circumcision is pointless for righteousness. Rather, he's saying that circumcision is pointless for righteousness because we are not justified by the works of the law. And the reason we are not justified by the works of the law is because we failed the moral aspects of it. Abstaining from fornication, abstaining from stealing not hating your brother, and so on and so on. These are the reasons why we cannot be justified by our works. Much in the same way that Paul said that we cannot be justified by the law, Peter also said that the Mosaic law was unbearable. Acts 15 documents a dispute among Christians over circumcision, debating whether Gentiles ought to be circumcised. There was a certain sect of believing Pharisees, verse 5, arguing that they needed to keep the whole law of Moses. Peter answers them, affirming the gospel is by believing, in verse 7, and that both Jews and Gentiles were saved through grace, verse 11, and he also says in verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers 
nor we were able to bear. So let's try to put this into perspective. Circumcision is a one-time act. You do it once and it's over with. And only the men have to do it. The women don't even have to do it. Now, I do recall the story in Genesis where circumcision was made some grown men saw for a few days, which I'm sure was very difficult for them, but obviously not impossible. And anybody who is circumcised as a baby has already met this requirement of the law. If we are supposed to buy this argument, we are not justified unto righteousness by the works of the law such as circumcision, the unbearable law, but we are justified unto righteousness by the law of Christ works, which apparently includes all of the moral things and turning away from the sins of the flesh. So these people are trying to tell me that the one-time act of circumcision, which you don't even have to do if you're a woman, that's too difficult. That's an unbearable law that nobody can seem to meet, even though they've been circumcised. But an 18-year-old testosterone-filled, red-blooded, unmarried male who lives in a society where he's surrounded by women dressing in skimpy outfits and yoga pants, he should be able, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to overcome the sin of looking upon a woman to lust after. That's not too unbearable for him. But heaven forbid he gets circumcised. That would be asking the impossible. Is that what these fools are trying to tell us, seriously? And I can already imagine their talking points here. Well, the Old Testament law was impossible because you couldn't possibly present all of the sacrifices. <laughs> Well, actually, if you turned from all of your sins and obeyed all of the moral requirements of Christ, it wouldn't be that difficult, because you wouldn't need to keep giving these sacrifices. They would be easy laws to keep. Well, what about the cleanliness rituals? You couldn't possibly keep all of those, could you? <laughs> well, actually, only unhygienic people have a problem with cleanliness, and there are plenty of Christians who would find it easy to stay away from the congregation. Well, John says his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. <laughs> Well, actually, he wasn't talking about the Mosaic Law or keeping moral statutes for salvation. You unlearned idiot. He only mentioned two commandments, believing and loving one another. Only believing was directly coupled with eternal life. Well, Galatians says faith works by love. You have to do the works of love in order to be saved. <laughs> well, actually, you're a moron who can't read because it says faith works by love. It doesn't say faith works love. Whose love? God's love, as it is written, for God so loved the world. It's God's love that works faith, therefore faith works by his love. Well, Jesus gives you the power to overcome your sins. <laughs> well, actually, if God could give us the power in the New Testament, why didn't he just give the Old Testament Jews the power to do circumcision? They didn't even need this power, they succeeded at fulfilling circumcision. Yet Peter says this law was unbearable. And look, this thing that God gives you the power to overcome your sins, quote-unquote, first of all, the Bible does not state that that's the Holy Spirit's role, for a start. The people who teach this haven't overcome their own sins, and it's amazing to me how some of the most wicked, evil, lazy, derelict hypocrites teach work salvation. It's incredible. And look, look up the word overcome in the King James Concordance. Look it up in the present tense, overcome, the ongoing tense, overcometh, or the past tense, overcame. You will never find this terminology, overcome your sins, in the Bible. Now, sinless perfectionists of all kinds of varieties love to bang on about this concept every single day. The Bible never uses this terminology. It's as simple as that. And they use other sensational terms like the power of grace to overcome your sins or, you know, overcoming the power of sin. But again, the Bible does not use these terms. They're just using the swelling words of man's wisdom. And they've got this one verse in Titus that they use. But again, if they would actually learn to read, that's not what it actually says. It was the moral law where we failed. Peter says that nobody was able to bear this yoke because if you have to keep circumcision, you have to keep the whole law, including the moral law. But it was the moral law where we all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. On top of this, Jesus made the moral law even more difficult than it already was in the Old Testament, as we've just seen. The New Testament describes grace or justification unto righteousness by faith as liberty. If we are not obliged to the Mosaic law, but we have to keep moral commandments under the law of love, to God's perfect standard, by the way, for righteousness, then we are not at liberty. Rather, we are under a heavier, weightier, more unbearable law than we already would have been under the old Mosaic law. So look, this law of Christ versus law of Moses argument, it's a complete fraud invented by the servants of Satan to preach work salvation. But instead of just being polite and considerate, and pissing off to Judaism with the Talmud, or pissing off to Islam with the Quran, or pissing off to Mormonism with the Book of Mormon. They have to creep into Christianity and our Bible like little cockroaches and ruin it for everybody else. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you that it's by grace through faith that you're saved and not of yourselves.